In the last video we have provided an introduction to the physical state. The physical state is just a collection of variables that specify the conditions under which your sample is in. Uh, right, so uh, it has four variables and those are the amount of substance that you have, volume, pressure, temperature and state of matter. Now we've talked about uh, the amount and the volume in the prior video, also about the state of matter. And then in this video we just speak upon uh, pressure, try to define what pressure is, and then uh, comment, comment a few things about uh, interest in aspects of pressure that will appear in this course. Alright, so we begin then with the definition of pressure. In the more, more elementary form, pressure is just force over area. Okay, and uh, uh, to try to figure out how the units of pressure work, then we have to uh, try to derive an SI unit for pressure uh, based on base SI units, right? So remember that force is mass times acceleration, and then uh, divided over area, and uh, we already have base units for each one of these variables, right? So for mass, that will be the kilogram, then uh, for acceleration that is just uh, meter, second to the minus two, and then area is just length squared, so that will be meter squared. Okay, so when you aggregate all of these units, you get that is going to be kilogram, meter to the minus one, second to the minus two, and of course that, well, those are very unwieldy uh, units to use. Uh, instead, what we do is we redefine a uh, unit of uh, SI or an SI unit of pressure as simply the Pascal, uh, P sub A. So one Pascal is equal to one kilogram per meter per second square. Okay. Now uh, there are many other uh, units for pass uh, for pressure that we will be using throughout uh, this course, right? So for example, the atmosphere uh, is one of them, and the conversion between ATM and Pascal is one of one, three to five. Okay, so as you can see, uh, uh, there's a large conversion factor between these two pressure units, and that means that either a Pascal is a very small unit of pressure, or that one atmosphere is actually a large amount of pressure, and both of them uh, can be argued to be actually true. Uh, all right, so there's more more units of pressure that will be interesting. The bar will be interesting because uh, in the future, we'll, we'll be referring to standard conditions. And that standard conditions imply that the pressure should be one bar. Uh, in reality, the difference between one bar and one ATM is very, very small. They're actually only different by about 1%. And uh, if you're not doing very accurate work, you can actually use them uh, interchangeably. Even though for accurate work, then you must consider uh, that there is a 1% difference between uh, uh, an atmosphere and a bar. Now there's a final uh, pressure unit that we uh, are going to see you that, or that it are, is common, right? And that will be uh, torr or millimeters of mercury, right? So one ATM is equal to 760 torr or 760 millimeter of mercury. Okay, so this is, um, all of the uh, uh, pressure units that we're going to be handling in this course. Now let's then retake uh, a little bit about uh, or the discussion of the atmospheric pressure. Okay, so the atmospheric pressure, if you have a sample uh, that is open to the atmosphere, so I don't know, maybe suppose that you have here a container and here you have some liquid water, H2O. Since this is open to the atmosphere, uh, then the pressure of that sample will be the atmospheric pressure, so that will be 1 atm. Uh, now that pressure, that atmospheric pressure, is actually caused by collisions of the gases in the atmosphere, in the Earth's atmosphere, with that liquid. Right. So here you have a little, uh, uh, quite a bit of nitrogen, a little bit of oxygen, a trace amount of argon, and some other gases, and all those are actually moving uh, in a way that we will study using kinetic theory of gases. But uh, those motions are extremely fast. And what happens is that when those gases collide with that water, okay, that causes a force 
over some area, which means that you're applying effectively a pressure. Okay, so that is the origin of atmospheric pressure. Now, uh, this is a system open to the atmosphere, but you could actually have something similar in a system that is close to the atmosphere. Okay, so suppose now that you have here a cylinder uh, with a movable piston. Okay, so here you have a piston uh, that can actually go up and down uh, in a frictionless way. This is going to be a setup that we will be using a lot uh, in thermodynamics problems. And inside here you actually are going to have a gas. Right, so in principle you might have here two different pressures. You will have the pressure of the gas, which we're going to call P sub N, internal pressure, and here you will have uh, the external pressure, P external which will be uh, one atmosphere if you're not weighing down this piston, but if you put a mass here, right, that, it, that adds uh, uh, to, that, to that force, then you will have an external pressure of more than one atmosphere. Now, under the conditions of that gas, it's quite possible that the pressure of the gas may be larger or smaller than the external pressure. And if that's the case, then the piston will move either up or, or down. But if you let the system reach equilibrium, there's going to be a point in which, well, this piston is not going to move up or down, and that means that the external pressure will be exactly the same as the internal pressure, right? So what that would mean is that, is that the gas collisions of the atmosphere on this side of the piston uh, push that piston down with the same force as the uh, gas of the sample, those molecules are pushing the piston up. Right, so when you have that, the forces are equal, the pressures are equal, because the area is the same, and you read something that is called mechanical equilibrium. Okay, so there's an equilibrium between the forces of the outside gas and the inside gas. And that will be a point that is also important to note in uh, many problems in the future. Okay, so that's going to be uh, uh, a little bit of uh, uh, the initial definitions of pressure. Now we're going to take a little bit of an aside to define a very special type of pressure that is called hydrostatic pressure, and that will also appear in a, in a series of problems as we move through this semester of thermodynamics. Okay, so from now on, I'm going to talk about uh, the concept of hydrostatic pressure. Right, so let me, let me see if I can uh, draw here a diagram to show you how that is. Okay, so there was an Italian scientist who actually realized and started to formulate what hydrostatic pressure is. Okay, and this was Torricelli, and uh, what Torricelli was doing is, well, uh, they simply had a vat of liquid mercury, okay, so that is, yes, liquid mercury, and uh, what they were doing is just submerging uh, glass vials, uh, glass columns into this vat of mercury, and just flipping, uh, or filling those, those glass columns with mercury, and then flipping them upside down. Okay, so essentially you get to, to a point where you have the glass cone that was initially full of liquid mercury upside down into that uh, container, right? So there's your glass column. And the observation was that uh, with astonishing reprodu reproducibility, right, you actually generated here uh, a column of liquid that had uh, a rather constant height, right? So this height uh, tended to be about 760 millimeters, right? And uh, on top of here, you actually had a vacuum, right? Or, uh, or perceivably a vacuum, so no liquid. It was actually a clear interface between the liquid mercury and, and then uh, gas, or, or a vacuum in, in the, at that time. And this, this height actually did not depend on how tall the column was, okay? Did not depend on how wide that glass column was, or whether it was uh, deeply submerged or, or not. Right, so the difference in height between the surface and uh, the top of the column uh, is constant to 760 millimeters. Now, this is actually a manifestation of the concept of mechanical equilibrium that we have explained in, the, uh, in, just, uh, 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 in this video. Right, so the idea is that here, you actually have uh, an external pressure. This is open to the atmosphere and we can write it as P external. So that is going to be about 1 atm. Now, uh, so what happens then is that uh, that pressure is actually forcing uh, liquid out the column, okay? But at the same time, we recognize 
that uh, the molecules that are above this level in this column, those are subject to gravity that is actually pushing down uh, those molecules of the liquid downward. Okay, so uh, you reach a mechanical equilibrium between those two uh, forces, and that happens to be just at the point where that uh, height of liquid mercury is 760 millimeters. Okay, so uh, that means that there's something that uh, there's an internal pressure in that column of liquid, right, that is equal to the external pressure that is trying to drive liquid up that column, and that uh, uh, pressure of the liquid is what we call the hydrostatic pressure. Okay, so that uh, hydrostatic pressure is the pressure that you experience or that a sample experiences when submerged into a liquid. Right, so the question is, well, do we have a definition for hydrostatic pressure or a way to operate with it comfortably? And the answer is yes, this is not difficult. Right, so let's retake here the definition of pressure, which, which is simply force over area. And we're going to just uh, spill it out a little bit, right, so that is mass. Notice that in this case, you're, uh, uh, your uh, acceleration is just going to be the gravitational constant, right, so mg. And then the area is just the cross-section of that column area. Now, uh, notice that we would be interested in actually being able to reformulate this in terms of the height of that column, because that's something that is very easy to measure. Okay, mass is quite difficult to know exactly what is the mass of mercury that you have in that column. Uh, the area you could, you could measure quite well, but, but the, um, the height is something very easy to measure, right? So one of the things that we can uh, actually try to do is maybe multiply and divide by height and see if this equation transforms into something that depends on height and is still really easy to use. Okay, so let's see. Notice that in the denominator, right, the area of that, the cross-sectional area of the cone times the height, that is simply the volume inside uh, that uh, column, right, so that will be volume, and then here you will have mass, g, and h, but of course we quickly recognize that the mass uh, of molecules inside that column over the volume is just simply the density of that liquid. Okay, so that turns out to be the definition of hydrostatic pressure, where this is the Greek letter rho, which uh, we're going to be using for density. Okay, so the hydrostatic pressure, which is the pressure that is exerted by a column of liquid on top of a sample, this is rho gh, where rho is the density of the liquid, g is the gravitational constant, and h is the height of the column. Okay, so let's wrap up this video on pressure. Pressure is one of the variables that you need to specify to uh, define the physical state uh, of a sample. Now we have seen the units of pressure, which in the SI system are Pascal, and ways to convert between SI units and other types of units. We've also talked about the atmospheric pressure and the concept of mechanical equilibrium. And then we have wrapped up the, the video by uh, introducing the concept of hydrostatic pressure, which will appear in problems dealing with uh, things like osmotic pressure and so forth. In the next video, we're actually going to be talking about the concept of temperature, which is the last variable that we need to define the physical state.